OpenSense is a popular firewall, which is a fork of the more familiar PFSense firewall. And what it intends to do is to be more open source, but also to offer more frequent updates. So for example, you'll find that at the time of this recording, PFSense is using FreeBSD version 12, whereas OpenSense is using version 13. Now, although those are different major versions, there is still a chance that both do have the same vulnerability, in which case I wouldn't really be considering using both of these in a two vendor firewall solution. So OpenSense is more of an alternative to PFSense, if you will. Now, aside from the appeal of being open source, one of the actual benefits I would say that OpenSense brings to the table is local support of a plugin known as ZenArmor, formerly known as Sensei, which offers next generation capabilities. Now you can use it in PFSense, but you would have to manage that through the cloud. And that for me is just a deal breaker. But how do you install OpenSense? Well, if that's something that you're interested in finding out, then stick around and watch this video because that's what will be going over. Now, before we try installing OpenSense onto a computer, it's best to make sure that that computer is actually compatible. So over here on OpenSense's website, they do give you some of the details about the architectures and that are supported as well as some of the hardware requirements. Key things to point out are that we need an x86-64 CPU. In other words, your typical Intel or AMD CPU, which is 64 bits. So if you've got a, like a really old computer, which is 32 bits, then that's not going to work. Similarly, an actual Raspberry Pi, for example, won't work either because that uses an ARM CPU versus one of these x86-64 versions. Most computers that are out there would easily meet the reasonable uh, requirements here, which is a dual core a CPU, four gig of memory, and 40 gig of storage space. I mean, they do mention, you know, you could put this onto like memory cards as well. But one thing to point out is you, you don't want to be installing this on a USB flash drive. It just wouldn't be able to tolerate the number of writes required because a firewall is going to be generating a lot of logs. It's got to store those logs somewhere. And typically they'll actually go wherever the actual operating system's installed. So in most cases, you'll probably go with an SSD it's typically going to have a lot more than 40 gig of storage capacity. So you shouldn't have really any problems trying to meet those requirements. If you are going to be thinking about more features, um, you're going to have more users on the network, more traffic throughput, then you might want to think about more actual cores, um, more memory, more storage capacity, as I suggest here. But typically a computer these days would easily handle those requirements. Now, if you don't already have a computer to install OpenSense on, then you might want to consider one of these Protecti bolts. Now, you can get them in different sizes, so you can get two port versions, which is the minimum we're looking for for a firewall, four port as well as six port. And the appeal of having all these extra interfaces is that we're going to be breaking a network down into little individual network segments for security reasons. And it's better if you can dedicate an entire interface to each individual network segment. That way you get better firewall throughput uh, for all of your computers. Another appeal about these is that they also support ASNI, which is good for VPN encryption. Now you can download the installation software directly from OpenSense's website. Now there is a drop down menu for the architecture type, but because it only supports one CPU type, it doesn't give you any other choices really. But it does give you quite a few options when it comes to the image type. Now, which one you pick depends on how you're planning to do your installation and what it is you actually want to install onto. So the default setting is VGA. And if you've got a physical computer, for example, and you want to create a bootable USB drive and boot from that, then just leave it on the default settings here. Now, on the other hand, if you actually want to create a virtual machine, and boot it from an ISO image, or you've got a physical computer and that's got a built-in DVD drive and you want to boot that from an ISO image, then you change the actual image type to DVD. Now, normally with operating systems, what I would do is I would just go for the ISO image. But what I've found and what I've seen in the actual forums is that the imaging software 
that's used to create bootable USB drives does have a problem with the ISO image. So if you want to create that bootable USB drive, you do want to make sure you go for the VGA option there. Other than that, it's a case of picking the closest server to you from the drop down uh, option here for the mirror location. So I'm just going to pick that. Then click on download and it starts the actual download process. Now the file that you've downloaded will be archived and that's because it's been compressed into a smaller file. And if you've opted for the ISO image in particular, you'll need to be able to extract that file from the archive in order to be able to use it. Now, your typical Linux distro does actually come supplied with an archive manager, but operating systems like Windows don't, meaning you have to download an installed one. So the common one that I use is called 7-Zip. So I've downloaded that, run the executable, and installed the software. And now that I've done that, what I can do is right-click on the file here, and then there's an option in the menu for 7-Zip, and then that opens up a bigger menu giving me options. So in this case, I just want to extract the ISO image from that uh, actual compressed file. So I'm just going to select extract here, and then that'll give me an actual ISO image that I can use. Now, if you're planning to create a bootable USB drive, then you're going to need some software that can take the image file you've downloaded and write that to a USB drive. Now, your typical Linux distro usually comes supplied with that type of software, but Windows doesn't, in which case we need some additional software for a Windows computer. Rufus is a common option. So if we scroll down to the download section, we've got a choice here of an executable and also a portable version. What I've done is to actually just download the executable itself. I've still got an image file here that I've downloaded, which is compressed. And I haven't uncompressed it because Rufus can actually handle that. So what I'm going to do is double click on the executable. I then get a warning message pops up. Basically, the application needs advanced privileges, user access control. For example, it needs to actually format uh, the flash drive. So I've got to give it that permission. So I'll click yes. It automatically detects my USB drive. Now, if you do have multiple drives, do make sure you pick the correct one. It could be because basically it's just going to completely overwrite that drive. We'll leave the boot selection on the default settings and then click on select to actually tell it which image to use. Now I've got multiple files to pick from, but I'll, I want to make sure I pick the actual image file. So you can see we've got .iso files, but then we've got a .img file. That's the, uh, the one that I downloaded to create a bootable uh, USB drive. So we select that and click on open. There's nothing else uh, here I particularly want to um, choose. So I'm just going to click start. It pops up a warning in my case, because I've, I've already got um, a USB drive that's been used in the past. It's complaining basically it's got multiple uh, partitions and they're all going to be destroyed. I'm going to click OK because I want it to proceed. It then warns me again. It's basically just making sure that you are deleting everything. Do you know that? Are you absolutely sure? So yeah, that's fine. Click on OK. And then off it goes and it, it's going to delete all the partitions. It's going to completely rewrite this drive. It'll do verification afterwards. And then eventually I'll end up with a bootable USB drive. Now I'm going to be installing OpenSense as a virtual machine on ESXi because it's going to make the actual recording for this video a lot easier. But the installation process is going to be the same even if you use a physical computer. I just want to point out a particular issue I ran into when trying to install this on ESXi. So we'll create a new virtual machine. Click on Next. Now I'll just give it a name here. For the OS family, we'll just pick Other. The OS version, we go for FreeBSD 13, and it's the 64-bit version, because that's what uh, OpenSense uses. Click on Next. Tell it where to create this virtual machine. Click on Next. The key thing I want to point out is this, the SCSI controller. It defaults to VMware Para Virtual, and I found it actually ran into problems by just going with that specific option. Um, it'll get so far through the installation process and it'll fall over because it can't write in the actual hard drive. 
So it's better to change that to LSI Logic Parallel. I mean, set all the other settings as you wish, but do make sure you change that SCSI controller setting. Now, whether you install OpenSense onto a virtual machine or a physical computer, the process is going to be the same. So we'll power this on. And then as soon as it gives me the option, I'll click on the console window here. I don't really get much time to make any decisions when it comes to the actual boot process, but really it doesn't make any difference. What's going to happen is it's going to boot up from the installation image that I've provided this virtual machine, and then it's going to halt at a login prompt. So once it gets to that stage, I'll bring you back. Well, the computer is now booted up, but we're sitting at a login prompt. In other words, the actual installation process hasn't even started. And the reason for that, if you look at the welcome messages, because it's booted into live mode. So in other words, it's booted up the computer and it's giving us a working firewall, but we actually want to install uh, OpenSense onto our computer. In which case, I need to actually start the installation process. So to do that, we need to log in as installer. It does mention higher up um, in a message, no such user installer, but it does exist. So I'll hit return. Then put in the password, which is OpenSense. Hit return. And then that actually starts the install process. It defaults to a US keyboard, so I do need to change that. So I'll just use the up and down arrow keys to find my keyboard. Then hit return. I'll hit the up arrow again because I don't want to actually test this keyboard. I do know it works. And then I've got a choice of either UFS or ZFS as the file system to install. Uh, onto, in which case I'm going to opt for the more modern ZFS. So I'll select that, hit return. Now, if this had been a physical computer and I wanted redundancy, I'd have two drives and I'd opt for a mirror for the boot operating system, because that's usually what you use for uh, operating system. It, it's unusual to use any of these other RAID options uh, for actual operating systems. So typically, as I say, it would be the mirror. But in the case of a virtual machine, or if you've only got one hard drive anyway, they go for this option here, which is Stripe. Because when it comes to actual virtual machines, all of the redundancy takes place either within the hypervisor itself, or you're storing onto shared storage, such as a NAS, for example, and that's got redundancy built in. So it would be unusual to want some sort of redundancy for your hard drives in a virtual machine anyway. In any case, once you've made your choice, hit return. Now, it then comes up with a list of drives that are available. Now, I've only actually got one uh, to choose from, so I'm just going to press the space uh, key here to pick my drive, and then I'll hit return. And then it's warning me that it's going to basically wipe the contents of the disk, so I was just using the left arrow there. I had to change it from no to yes. And then off it goes and starts the process. Now, once that install process is finished, it gives us a choice between changing the root password and completing the install. Now, you can change the root password now if you like, but later on, what we'll be doing is running an installation wizard the first time we log in. And one of the things that's going to ask you to do is to change the root password anyway. So in which case, what we're going to do is I'm going to opt for complete install. I just use the down arrow key to select that. What I'm going to do first, though, is I'm going to disconnect this CD drive. I'm just going to scroll down, tell it to disconnect that. Uh, disconnect anyway and override the lock. Yes, I do. Come back and pick my virtual machine. Hit return. And then off it goes, starts the reboot. Well, the computer is now back up and running. And we've got our basic installation of OpenSense onto this computer. You see in this console prompt here that there's no mention of it being in live mode. It has actually installed OpenSense onto the computer. And in my case, I've got two interfaces. One's the LAN interface, one's the WAN interface. So whereas the WAN interface has obtained an IP address through DHCP, the LAN interface will always have this IP of 192.168.1.1. 
So for me to actually complete the installation process and then start managing uh, OpenSense, I would need to connect a computer to the actual firewall. So typically you'd plug the firewall into a switch, plug your computer into a switch. The computer will obtain an IP address through DHCP because OpenSense actually runs a DHCP service out of the box. And then what you would do is connect to this IP address of 192.168.1.1 through a web browser. Now connecting this Windows computer to the same network that the LAN interface of OpenSense is connected to. So if I pull up the actual details uh, for this interface here, you can see that it's got an IP address of 192.168.1.100. You'd obtain this from the DHCP server 192.168.1.1, in other words, OpenSense. And it's using it as its default gateway, as well as its DNS server. So not surprisingly, when I point my web browser to HTTPS um, 192.168.1.1, I'm getting a connection to OpenSense, but the browser doesn't trust this um, certificate because it's self-signed, so I need to bypass that. So I need to click on Advanced and then just tell it to proceed, basically. So we'll click on that option. And then it asks me to log in. So I'm going to log in as root and the password is OpenSense. So because we're logging in for the first uh, time, it's going to start an actual wizard just to complete that basic install. So we're going to click on next. So we can change the name if you like, we can change the domain name. I mean, I'm going to leave the host name as is, but I'm going to at least change the domain name. I like to use Cloudflare uh, for my DNS servers on the internet. So I'm going to put in the ones that provide some form of malware protection for DNS searches, but because OpenSense is getting an IP address on the WAN interface through DHCP, you can see there's an option here where any DHCP server that's provided over the WAN would override these. So I'm going to deselect that option. Um, by default, it's set up to have its own unbound DNS server. So we're just going to leave that set as is. I'm also going to enable these options to take advantage of DNSSEC. So there's one to enable the support as well as to harden against DNSSEC data problems. Click on next. You can change the time server. You can change the actual time zone if you like. So I'm going to make mine a bit more specific. Set mine to London then click next. It's then setting up the details for the one interface. Now you can set this up with a static IP address. For example, you can set up a PP over Ethernet, PPTP and so on. Uh, in my case, I'm just going to leave this set to DHCP as is, because that's perfectly fine. The only thing I need to do is to disable these features. One is to block RFC 1918 private networks as well as the bog on networks. That's just because this is actually connecting to another upstream firewall. So it's going to need connectivity to some private IP addressing on my actual network. If this was touching the internet, I would have left those on their defaults though. In any case, however you set the actual WAN interface, we'll click on next. Next thing it wants to know is what do you want to use uh, for the IP addressing for the LAN interface? Now, in my particular case, I don't like using these default IP addressing. It makes it um, easier for a hacker. If somebody were to get onto this network, that information is the default. And I don't like doing that. It's not really a good security practice to leave things on the default. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to change at least the third octet. Um, in my network, I use completely different IP addressing anyway, but for the sake of this demo, what that's all going to do is just change the third octet. If you want to make the actual network range bigger, you can lower the actual subnet mask. If you want to make it smaller, um, you can increase it. 24 is usually the typical uh, for networks anyway. So click on next. And now it's actually asking, do you want to change the root password? So it, it gave us that option earlier on, but since it was going to ask me in the wizard anyway, I thought, well, I may as well just leave it um, until now to change it. So I'm going to put a password in that I want to use, but I would recommend something which is a lot more stronger, a lot more complicated than this user password manager. To me, this is the best time to do it because you can copy and paste in a very long and complex password. Whereas if you're on a console um, session, yeah, you wouldn't really get those options. So now that I've changed that, I mean, it does say if you just leave it empty, it'll stick with the existing one, but 
as I said, it's better to not use a default password in the first place. So you do want to use something better. Click on next. And then that's it. All we now need to do is click on reload for the actual changes to apply. The only thing to bear in mind is I've changed the IP address. So there's a bit more work to get done. Now, because I changed the IP address of OpenSense, my web browser here has just basically timed out. In other words, it's still trying to connect to the old IP address of OpenSense and it's going to keep trying, but it's just going to sit on this page forever. Another thing to point out is the computer I'm using is also holding on to an old IP address that it got from the DHCP server on OpenSense. In other words, OpenSense didn't force it to release the IP address and ask for a new one. So what I need to do first is to actually go to the actual network card for this computer. Uh, it's the easiest way I find to do it is to just disable the interface, re-enable the interface, and then if we have a look at the details of the network card now, you'll see how the third octet has actually changed. Now, this time around, for whatever reason, it's 192.168.100.10, but it doesn't really matter. It's really up to the DHCP server what IP addresses it hands out. Now, I need to now point this web browser to the proper IP address, which will be 100.1. Again, then, it's a self-signed certificate that the web browser doesn't trust, so I need to accept that. I'm going to now log in as root. And I'll log in with the password that I gave it during the, uh, the wizard setup. And now we're connected into uh, OpenSense, and the basic installation is now complete. Now this video is only really intended to cover the basic installation of OpenSense and there is a lot more things that can be done to make this firewall better. But one thing I do need to do is make some alterations to the DNS service and that's because for one thing the actual firewall is listening to DNS requests on the WAN interface by default but also because of the way it's been set up particularly in my situation the DNS service isn't working the way I want it to work and my computers can't get access to the internet as a result. So if I go down to services, and if I then go down to unbound DNS, and then to general, you can see here by default the network interfaces that it's using are all, which are recommended, but I, as I say, I don't want that. I don't want this listening on uh, an actual WAN interface, so I'm going to select LAN only, and then I'm going to click save. And then I'll click Apply Changes. Another thing that I need to do is go to Query Forwarding. Because if I open a tab here, if I type in, say, google.com, for instance, hit Return, it just basically times out. It, it can't actually get connect to, uh, connection to the internet. It's trying to go to that unbound DNS server. The unbound DNS server in turn is then trying to get to the root servers. But the way I've got this set up is that I'm restricting access to only the Cloudflare servers. So I need to come back here and I need to override this here by selecting this option to use this, the actual um, system name service for query forwarding. So the actual DNS server it's actually answering internal DNS requests, but it's not coming back with a response for uh, public DNS resolution until I enable this box here. So as, it, as you can see, these were the servers I told it to use itself, but now it's actually going to use those for doing DNS forwarding basically for the actual computers on the internal network. So I'll click on apply. If we then go back to my web browser, and then click on refresh, you can see I've now got access to the internet. So what we've got is just a, a basic installation of the firewall. It is working, but it does need a lot more work. So for example, the firewall rules could certainly do with uh, improving. They're just too open. I do actually have a video that covers how to actually set up basic firewall rules, for instance. But there's a whole host of other things you can do with a firewall like this, including 
um, setting up plugins like Zenarmor, for instance, to give you a bit of visibility of your traffic and so on. Well, thanks for making it to the end of this video. I really do hope you found it useful. If so, then do click the like button and share as that'll help get the video out to more people who might find it useful as well. If you've got any comments or suggestions, please post those in the comments section below. And if you're new to the channel and you'd like to see more content like this, then yes, do subscribe. Just remember to set the bell icon to actually send you notifications when new content gets released. Although I also post to Twitter as well as Facebook. If you'd like to help the channel and support it, you can actually make contributions through PayPal and buy me a coffee. I've also got links to Patreon and there's also the join membership option for YouTube itself. Patreon and YouTube members do have the option to actually benefit from early access as well. But above all, many thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one.